So we're starting. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm 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 Will Rempel. Uh, thanks for uh, coming by and for inviting me out, letting me take the opportunity to do this talk. Uh, okay. We were already introduced to all of us, so uh, I'll just go continue along. So we started. You have at least some familiarity with with uh, the the topic here. Uh, so I'll just jump right into it. So. What they have here is one great idea that they like, which is this superposition. And this is what they're, they're, they're basically showcasing it right now. So as they start off with, neural networks are usually task specific. It's we've got one problem, let's get a neural network trained on it, and then we're done. So what they want to do now is instead is we want to, they want to have multiple models superimposed into one parameter set, into one neural network. Um, the way they're thinking of this is they say, think of the models now as if it was a memory. The, the weights, the biases, we're focusing just on the weights for this, uh, this paper, but that's the idea. Think of it as a memory that you want to store and you want to recall, just like any other kind of memory. The focus is on exclusively the, the weights and the linear transform. So if you're wondering where this super uh, superposition operation is done, it's done just immediately before the layer. So if you've got batch norm in between two layers, after the batch norm, after anything else you do, just before it goes into the, the layer. Go ahead. The question is, why do we need the like, general network? First of all, because okay, we have this task specific neural networks. So what's wrong with it? Oh, well, that then that comes to the motivation, which will be coming up. Okay. So yes, so the inspiration that they have for this is the associative memory. So if you remember uh, Hopfield nets, that would be called an auto associative memory, where it's a part of um, some input, a partial is put into the network and it recalls the whole. Then you have hetero uh, associative memories where there's a difference between what you're putting in and what you're getting out for the recall. Uh, what they're talking about is the, just wait, do I have it? The holographic reduced, oh, I forgot, H HRR, holographic reduced something. A at any rate, the idea is that what's being stored is a pair. It's like a key value pair and it's bi-directional. So you can do a recall of either element of the pair given the other element. So as we noticed this while we're going through the talk, if you notice that you have a lot of questions because it's like vague, what actually should be done? How should it be done? There's a lot of detail they're not giving it. They do that on purpose because they're showcasing this idea. They're saying this, this, is an, this is an idea that can be used in many different ways. So what we're doing is they're, they're, prevent, they're presenting a sample, a sampling of different things that you can do uh, for you know, how you can use this. So uh, is this going to go? All right, I got I to gotta break through the bounding box. All right. All right, and it, an example. If it goes, I was trying to look for some nice examples just for a nice little visual to get it together. You, you've seen uh, holograms where just like that, as you move around, the image changes. Instead of a bunch of pixels, those are weights. So as you're adjusting the context information, you're going to get a new set of weights. But it's the same image. So. Uh, yeah, that gives you the basic idea. Is this going to go? All right, hold on. So that's the idea. So we, you have different models. You're going to use context information in a certain way to combine them in such a way that you can also extract them later on. This combining is done even during training. So it's not like you train one, then train another, and then train another neural network and then combine them. Uh, this can be done every iteration. You can change context and tasks every iteration. You know, there's, you, you have options here. 
we were trying to think of a good example of to use this, but sorry, I, I can't think of anything other than if you have different images, tasks that really, really badly conflict with each other, perhaps you can, you, you want to uh, use something like this. There's better examples as we get into what they do, some of the, the experience they do, then it, it shows an idea of what the potential is for this. So the motivations for this, uh, exploiting excess capacity, uh, instead of pruning the network, uh, over-provisioning, training an over-provisioned network and then pruning it, leave the, the network at the same, the same size and try to exploit it in some way, get some advantage out of it. Um, are people familiar with the intrinsic dimension uh, paper? It was from Uber. Uh, if you're not, there's like an eight minute video where the guys do a like, wonderful job of uh, explaining it, you know, it's just brilliant. So it, it makes it very easy to understand. Bottom line is they, they show empirically how many parameters you may need for a task. So for example, they did it with MNIST, 720 parameters. That's all that was needed. Um, so there's plenty of room in your average neural network. There, there's, it's over-provisioned. Related to that, uh, the lottery ticket hypothesis paper, if there's, it's very recent. I don't know if it's true or not. They, they, it sounded exciting. Uh, they were just basically saying that um, large neural networks do well because you have a lot more uh, random initialized parameters. You get a better chance of having a good initialization. They're showing that actually the initialization matters so that if you have a very small network, uh, you may have lousy results. You may have to do it over and over and over again until you happen to get a good random initialization. So that's why they, this paper, apparently it was quite convincing that they showed that that's why a, a large network is useful. So you can exploit that as well. Um, continuous learning. So continuous learning, transfer learning, and online learning, those are all kind of related. Uh, continuous learning is literally that, lifelong learning. It goes on, new tasks are added. Um, transfer learning, you've heard of, that's when we have the cases where you, you want to exploit a previously trained network because the next task does share some similarity with the previous task and it will perform better. Uh, online learning is it's live learning. As the data comes in, uh, the network's being trained. So you know if it's like, say, stock market information, uh, things like that. With online learning, you can't use mini-batch. Uh, they, they mentioned some workarounds that other people use, apparently with, that's the reason for a reinforcement learning why you have replay buffers. Uh, and there's all these other different tricks to, that they use, but as they say, theirs is a more natural, smoother way to deal with this issue of online learning. Uh, with the transfer learning, what would be interesting, well, we'll get into that later. Um, so the important point with all of these is that somehow you can remember the past while training on new data and avoid catastrophic forgetting. Um, if you're familiar with this topic, that frequently happens if you are dealing with any of those, continuous learning transfer or online, uh, reusing models, you're going to forget from the past task and it apparently is pretty bad and it's, it's a serious hindrance, and so they say that this method overcomes that. Um, so the parameter superposition, PSP, and all their networks, they call them PSP something, PSP network. Um, so I, I assume that everybody was going through this material understanding. Hopefully there's some understanding of it that there is a context function indexed Right now, what we're going to talk about is the simple method of using this. Distinct models indexed by k. k equals 1 means task 1. k equals 2 is task 2. k equals 3 is task 3. That's going to return a context vector, element-wise multiplication with the input, and then that goes to the weight, the dot product with the weights. Uh, they mention as well, if, if you were going through the whole thing, that you can also you know, do element-wise uh, multiplication with the context vector and the weights, and then do the dot prot, you know, it goes the other way. And it's a different interpretation of what's, what's being done. Uh, capital M is the uh, 
input size throughout the entire paper. I presume that n would be the input size for the next layer. Uh, throughout as well, they're using complex numbers. Just a note, that would be good for discussion. Uh, perhaps then we'll get into this maybe later. Uh, we'll leave this for now and then we'll perhaps dig into the discussions. Either way, yeah, well, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume there's a lot of questions and there's definitely a lot of questions with me. So uh, they, what they do is they break down how this works uh, very briefly, how, how you get to have different models. The, they're just doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation to show that uh, you can, with a different context, uh, multiplied by the different inputs and with the different tasks, you can break up the summations uh, so that you have the left-hand side, that you have what you want, the model to be returned, and this is all the interference from the other models. So what is S? S is going to be um, the setup for K. So K is in the set of S, S, capital S, and S would be, say, one, two, three. That would be the set. That's for this example, the, the very base example. Um, so this is what you get you're, when you do the a retrieval using a context vector. You're going to get the, um, the weights that you want, uh, index by K, plus that epsilon error. And Perhaps we'll get back to that. But the, the analysis that they do, and that's in Appendix A, is that it doesn't add bias. They show this, they show this uh, through the map. Um, under mild assumptions, the variance is, doesn't have a significant impact. And the cost function and the training is very similar to if you were not using superposition. So that's, that's the main take home messages for this. So this is the, the visual representation of the, the basic idea. Do we have two questions? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, go. Um, proposition, can you go back to the propositions? Because I think there's a lot of content there. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by bias in proposition one? So in the paper it says ex expectation bias. of epsilon goes to zero, right? Yeah, I've got to try and remember, because yeah. I that was a while since I read the appendix, but it's basically it's just like the interference between the models, it's basically too small that it's neglectable. Do you remember what it was? was it epsilon so, yeah, the, was they're it? saying, so they're, yeah, that epsilon is that interference term, the term you don't want if you're trying to retrieve yeah. the model. Yeah, it's expectation question, right? is zero. Okay. Do you know, can you say a little bit about, like, expect, under what assumptions is it zero? I mean, there must be some I assumptions. Like, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I didn't think about that, actually, hmm. printing it out. I think they, they so, say more in the appendix, but I don't think there's that many assumptions for that part. There's a, for the variance, they say they, they give a couple. Of At some point, they were introducing a random vector that they were multiplying into their model, yep. and the assumptions were that the uh, elements of that random vector were independent, and under that assumption, the bias was zero in expectation. So is that random vector that the context vector? Yeah. In, and independent with which each element in that in that vector is independent. The the yeah. context vector was drawn from an independent distribution, a uniform distribution. Uniform. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uniform. Okay. For each coordinate, the coordinates of that vector are, are independent. Well, independent and uniform. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Okay. That's all right. Yes. Go ahead. Why do we have this assumption that we can like have this linear this segregation of the context is, I mean, for example, you can have the superposition, you can add them linearly. The context that you have, right? If you go to the previous slide, yeah. and the other, well, this one can, here, yeah. yeah. Why do you say that this is possible back then? Can, we, can, I, can I suggest, because he already said that he will cover that all during the discussions? Can, or, yeah, we, we uh, could do it, but I have a feeling like where discussions are going to be the most is going to be right here. Because this is the, yeah. okay. the difficult part. So, like, my understanding is well, why why do you have this assumption that it's possible that uh, you do separate the context linearly? You say that, okay, this is a part that's dependent on that context, and the rest of, like, for example, S 
not equal to k. Do you have the parts which are like that? Uh, do you mean the separation here, just right here from this to this? I mean, why? I mean, just okay. equality, right? Just an algebraic manipulation. No, I mean, so yeah, having different contexts, you can say that they're linearly separable. Is that okay? I mean, like, there's no assumption involved in it. Because, no. for example, you have these different types of images, and they can be correlated, right? So the context can be correlated. Right? Wow. That's for images, but this this part here, what we're looking at, that that would be the x term. In all so cases. How do you define the context essentially? Okay, so okay, I just ha I just have to jump in. Mm -hmm. I think you we, because it. if I may interrupt, um, we either need to go through this first and then we ask questions, um, or I guess leave it for the discussions. It's it's yeah. up to it's up to the speaker if you want to go through this. But I think asking questions before we went through this is premature. Yeah. So you can. It's up to you or up, up to. Yeah, you? I was thinking at first. Let's go right into it, but then perhaps maybe if we, as we go through the rest of the paper, um, maybe that might answer and might provide some clarification. Yeah, maybe just very high level mention of what they yeah. uh, what they achieved, which I think you hinted towards uh, uh, up to now, and then uh, and during the discussions we delve into uh, deep and let's let's uh, see what the rest of the paper is for now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It was probably a better idea to skip these for now. But okay. Uh, this was just the visualization. The idea is that, um, if, as you can see, the this, this storage, so say if you have, so um, you have one single node and you, you want to have three different uh, weight vectors for it. So you, the idea is you use, in this case, we'll get into the details. You're using the uh, element-wise product for the inverse context vectors to get them orthogonal to each other so that they can be distinguishable and you have the input that can then, that's going to be applied with a context vector to the weight vector that you want and they're, they're going to be, they're going to have a good multiplication whereas here, you know, that's standard dot product and then there'll be a, you know, some, a result with magnitude here whereas here these remain orthogonal and you know they're not they're, they'll have minimal to hopefully zero impact but yeah we'll we'll dig into that some more so the context information is uh, we've got options so yes uh, my question is that uh, you frequently use the word rotation but I think the rotation is by multiplying an orthogonal matrix rather than a bit above rather than point wise multiplication so why yes, because they do it more than one way. They do it, yes. They, like you were saying, they, they were using a rotational matrix? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right, right here. The con context representation, they use uh, rotation in unit unitary matrices. That's an option. That's actually the, the, the biggest option, the most parameter heavy op uh, option, uh, where you're adding the most to the network. So. Which one used uh, point-wise multiplication? I didn't see it. The point-wise, I believe, is the binary vector oh. type, kind, okay. and the, uh, the complex vector, yes and no. As best as I can tell, they do both. They do, they, because the com complex vector, they also turn that into a rotation matrix by making it a diagonal matrix. So the, basically the diagonal of the matrix is the elements from the context vector. And now you've got uh, rotation. Uh, with the binary vector, yeah, there's no matrix. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing this part anyway, so perfect timing with the question. Yeah. Uh, and then the one power is, so yes, there's binary vectors where the elements are either negative one or one. Complex vectors where it's a complex number for each entry. Uh, the rotation and unitary matrices are, are just that. Uh, unitary matrices matrices is a complex valued rotation uh, matrix. And then they go on that there's additional uh, mathematical theory for those who are so inclined to have that experience that it gets into group theory, etc. So uh, it can get fairly elaborate. The most simple one is one power where it's one complex number, uh, well, I should say the vector has, 
it's complex numbers. When you have a new task, a new K, you're just, that's the power that the exponent that you are using for on that vector of complex numbers. When you're doing the other complex vector for each new K, for each new task, it's a different context vector. So that's why the one power is, is even smaller, you know, than that one. Um, they, they mention as well now, those are the ones that they talk about. Then they talk about that context functions can be composed so that it can get more complicated and you can start doing operations now on context vectors. So up to this point, we were talking about a distinct a K was giving you, was acting like an index of distinct models. K1, K2, K3, you know, now we're talking about composing them and getting fancy and mixing and matching models in different ways. Uh, and then, well, there's different costs, uh, additional costs of complexity with these different methods. Yes? It's not premature to ask. I was wondering, what's the context, essentially? What do you mean by context? That, at, at the simplest, yeah, I was jumping ahead. At, at its most basic, it's when you're doing the element-wise product here. How do you define the context? Is there a different task? Okay, so just to make it back to the to the visual and like analogy. Right. So when you're creating those holograms, right. what you have is a laser that points to an object, yeah. right? And then you capture the Fourier transform of it, which is an image. Right? And so when you move this angle, so like it goes this way, and you move this angle. So the angle is the definition the of the angle context for us. It would be the context. On How you define specific. the context in this case depends on which specific context you're choosing. So if it's a binary vector, then that's how you're choosing the context. So you it's defined, you basically define it. So essentially it's like adding a, another parameter to the model and trying to train multiple models based on this parameter. Uh, yes, but it is added context. before you do the training, so you don't train to my understanding, and please correct so, me. Sometimes you, you have the option to train the context right. information. That's like a convoluted. Yeah, okay. yeah it, is, it is, that's right, it's additional parameters. Yeah. yeah. Because you can choose the context, so if you choose your context to be something that, again, depends on the training, so, right, you can make it as complex as you want, as convoluted as you want. But it can be as simple as just basically being a binary vector, right? Like zero, one, one, zero. So for example, if I imagine that I want to have a neural network that wants to play video games, okay? And then having Atari versus having, like, I don't know, FIFA, is it like concert the same context or no? You mean like, how do you define it? I'm like, you predefine it, you choose, I guess in this case you have to think what would be the best way uh, to... Because on the angle, I, I quickly understand, I like, okay. on the last... Okay, discussion more than. It's a good question. Okay, all right. I'll continue. This part maybe I I actually don't have the best idea of uh, understanding. Maybe somebody can help me. Uh, the far left is like the topology of if you were you doing binary vectors. That part I get. This is, if you're using the rotational matrices, the, the topology is an entire sphere, you know, with a dimension M is the space. Uh, for the complex vector idea, it's on the surface of a torus. And I have to admit, I don't understand that part, so please don't ask me. I don't know why, but anyways, it is. Uh, so we're, I was talking about composition of context information when we're getting more elaborate and fancy with the different kinds of tasks. So this is an example that's going to be used later on, is an average window of context vectors. So say if it was te temporal information, you would have the previous, oh yeah, right, hold on. Previous uh, context vector, the current one, and then the next one, and you average those out. So you've got a, a context vector that's kind of in in between there, all, all three of them, because now you don't want to distinguish between the different tasks at the different model weights. You actually want to purposely have them kind of muddled together because whatever this kind of task is, there's, there's useful overlap between the tasks and you want to try and capture that. 
So that's kind of the idea here. Uh, this is that one power one. So I mean, they said this inappropriately. There should be actually m different uh, angles because this is a, a vector of size m. Uh, but it's it's just to the exponent of k. That's the only difference. So it's being rotated around the, the complex plane, the different context vectors. So uh, this one is as simple as it gets. So these are the costs. Uh, quick, quick question, if you go back, uh, is phi learnable or? Can be. And you, it's, usually it is. There's, what they say is when you are using uh, the complex, uh, either the rotational matrices or the complex vectors, you probably want to exploit the differentiability. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. So the parameter costs, uh, this, this is the number of parameters that are initially added. So we're starting off with no superposition. It's an M by N matrix. If you want uh, binary or, yeah, if you want binary, it's going to be M times n plus 1. And then each additional model is another context vector of size m. For the complex vectors, again, you know, each new model is will introduce another complex vector of size m. I'm not sure exactly why it, yeah, I can't think of that. I, perhaps that's because it's going to be a diagonal rotational matrix. That's why it's the additional cost. The up, this is the upfront cost. The rotational uh, matrices are the most expensive, and I mean each new model is m squared, which I, I have to admit I'm, I, you know, why? Because now you're you're potentially increasing the the idea was to exploit what you have for parameters. Now you're adding a whole lot more. But I'm going to assume that the reason you would want to use something with so much extra parameters is because it's a very complicated, very fancy kind of task or set of tasks and. You know, you want to have that full expressivity. The one power is like the, the least expensive one. So each new model is just like one scalar value. That's it. You know, it's just whatever K is. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the cheapest one. Um, so the question is like, where, where would these go? This, we're just filling out now. This is the end of this part. Um, if you want to uh, employ this for an entire uh, network, for each layer, yes there is a different context function or a different set of contexts for each layer. So it's like CKL means that this layer has these context vectors, the next layer has these, et cetera, et cetera. For the convolutional network, you basically, your context vectors are going to be the same size as the kernel. And, and that's it. Um, do you have a separate one for each channel or not? That's another option. The, my understanding is it looks like they implemented it by having a separate context vector for each channel per each layer of uh, convolution. So I believe then, I don't know if I'm early or late. Do we have any questions, clarification questions? Yeah, sure. So I'm trying to sum up their approach. Would it be correct to say that they just like find a way to transform their weights and the input to make it apply to different problems. Like in the, in the case that you said, let's say you have three different tasks, it's, they're, they're just coming up with a transformation of the weights to, to transform the weights or parameters of the model to make it work for each of those three yeah. tasks. Yeah, if we go back to like that hologram image, the, the context vector is representing the position you have on the, on the image. And what the image changes, those pixels are the weights. So then you do that part first, uh, where you decide, I'm over here. It's this model I want. The weights are, are altered by that operation. And those are the weights that you use now, say, on the forward pass. And then when you back propagate through, you still keep it in that condition and modify the weights that way. Yeah. Um, if you go to the one one parameter for it, uh, yeah, there. So let's say that you had four tasks, right? Uh, you can you have uh, two pi. You know you can rotate around two pi. Does that mean k can be like zero pi over two pi, three pi over two? Uh, well, I suppose you could. I, I, keep, I kept thinking of it 
made it simple and just think thought of it as an index, just integers one, two, three, four. Yeah, because uh, like if you're if you're uh, if I understand you right, uh, but then the weights are gonna. No, no, that's fine. Mm. Mm. I, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah, so, so basically they have to be different. Uh, for every task, you're going to have a different angle. Do we need to? Yeah, go okay. ahead. Could you go forward two slides? This is where they're doing superposition in intermediate <laughs> layers. Do you remember if G was the activation yes. function? So that didn't make sense to me how they could use linear superposition when activation functions are always nonlinear. So, where would, well, the, the easiest answer is because they do it first, I suppose. Where would be the issue that you can think of? Well, we're using linear superposition, and at the end of the day, we want the ability to undo that, to get back a certain context. But if we're applying nonlinearities onto that, we're ruining the superposition, I would think. This part, uh, yeah, it wasn't think, totally clear what, to me. I think the moral of Proposition 1 is that you don't ruin it that much. Okay. I think that's the whole... Oh, you're you're talking about the interference? Yeah, I think, I think so, right? Is that... I wasn't sure about this hmm. part. Yeah, if you're t I, because you're saying nonlinearity, I think what matters is the operation is done first. You get a result okay. of certain weight values. Those are the ones you're using. So even though you're passing through to a nonlinearity, um, and then if we're we're going we're back propagating, don't forget we're doing the partial the chain rule with the partial derivatives. So yeah, sure, there's an activation function that has its own derivative, but then the, you have the partial derivatives for the different values of w, x, d, and now in this case potentially c is added as well as another value that can be uh, you know that's at the end of the chain rule. Right, for the back prop. So it it's a it doesn't matter. It comes out to, to be the same. So um, so you, you, you mentioned earlier that um, uh, at least in these experiments apparently that the projection layer is fixed, so we don't back propagate into the projection layer. Uh, so projection layer, the first layer that you like when you let's say you change your cake, you get a different context vector. Yeah. Right? That context vector is uh, you don't the, the weights for that like the, the parameters they are fixed. You don't back propagate um, uh, the errors to that vector. Is that correct? Do you mean okay? So mm, you're no. let's uh, do you want to pick a layer like say the, the first the first hidden layer? So okay, then maybe a, a better question is uh, then you have um, that context you have it at each layer then? Yeah, because you have layers, right? Yeah, I see. Okay, so my assumption was wrong. Uh, I was gonna say that if it's if you're not changing it, then you're not you're not back propagating the nonlinearities back to it, but apparently you are. So yeah, yeah, so and it's, that's a valid question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, you had it. Um, so if we think of this like uh, operation as a transform, is, do they mention that it has to be um, reversible? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. 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 The I guess what what do you gain from um, from it being reversible? Why do you want that to be? When you say reversible, like do you mean? Uh, well, there's two things you can reverse. You can get back the the superimposed the the set of weights where everything is superimposed on them, or you can recover um, the specific weight set for each different task. So you can recover all of that, like the the weights. The weights that are all superimposed, that's just the default. That's whatever numbers you, you see there in memory. That's, that's all the suit. Say you've, you've, you've trained three tasks. You've gone through three different tasks. Whatever numbers you see there in memory, that's the, uh, the superimposed weight matrix. You perform an operation in order to get the specific weights for each task. Now, are you, when you're asking reversible, do you mean the context? So can I go from that specific set of weights, can I go back to the superposition and then go back to another set of weights? Or? I presume so. I think you have to you otherwise your epsilon would never be think, zero. Think of it as doing a zip file. You take your 20 files 
and you say, okay, you're sipping them off, and you're putting them in a thing that you can't see, and then you train that, and it's all inside of it. And at the end, so the, the training and the different layers will change this. But at the end, you just take like an image, like, like when you have a Fourier transform, and then you do, you take the Fourier transform to do the, your sipping. Uh, and then once you've done all the training, like the G at the end, then you go back to your inverse Fourier transform, which is basically just the inverse of the weights that you're having at the end which is your own zipping your files. But the files inside, instead of being the original, are the result of what you trained for each of them. So each file is the result of the model, the specific model. Right. So I just use it without zipping it. Yeah, you would just have to train the same thing. I don't know, if you chose 10 models, then you just have to train the same thing 10 times separately, right? That's the... No, I mean, uh, zip it, train the model, and then uh, apply the model directly on different tests without unzipping it. I... No, but then you have a model that has, been, that, that, that has been trained on all of the contexts. Yeah, it will be big. No, 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 it's not going to be big. It's going to... You have the same network, exact same network. And because you've trained it on different contexts, okay, you're gonna have this general, uh, you're gonna have this general architecture yeah. uh, that has no idea how to do anything without this context. Uh, but when you are applying it to a specific task, you apply the uh, context of vector yes. on each input of the layer. Yes. yes. And uh, then that means you. Theoretically, you can still use without unzipping it. I mean, can you? Yes. yes, but why would you want to do that? What is the like? I'm sure there must be an application where that would be useful. Mm -hmm. But okay, there's the two be? ways of viewing this. The context can apply to the inputs, or going the other way with the multiplication, yeah. it can apply to the weights. So what you're describing is applying it to the inputs. Yeah. Yeah. And you were describing the other way. So. But it's the same thing. Basically. And I think you were you were talking about what if we were to now. After we superimposed with three different tasks, let's not use any context information, and now let's train on the set of weights as they are. What would happen? Is that what you're asking? No, I, I was asking um, if we train three models independently, and then uh, mix the model, and then uh, retrain them again on the same kind of data until they reach the equilibrium. And uh, what in this case all the all the weights are like uh, there the weights of three networks are compressed and in this case uh, when you use this on three different tasks directly you apply the uh, the context vector on the input instead of trying to separate uh, well the weights yeah. from the compressed state. If you are applying the context vector to the input. It would be, my understanding is that's the same as if you were extracting the weights, modifying the weights. So that means uh, the uh, the superposition of operator being reversible is optional. Yeah, possibly. I agree. Possibly. Yeah. But what does it tell? You? Like, what is it telling you if you're just having them differently. So like say if one of your model is training for predicting a parameter and the other model is training not to get the same prediction but in this case to I don't know go backwards and see what are the the main parameters that you're that are important for you and then the third one is something completely different. So at the end I guess you have to know what does it mean to put them together. So what's the exit telling you? What is it telling you when you don't decompress them? I Can you know. do it? Yes, it's math. But why? What? What? Why? Where would you apply it to be important, right? Like, because in in when you separate them, it's like in my example was like, okay, so I I make a prediction, how many clients are gonna buy next month, and then where are these clients based on, and then 
what are the reasons that are more important for these clients to to have purchased stuff less month? For example, those are my three models that I'm training my data on. Right? And so at the end, if I decompress them, then I get the solution for the three things that I'm looking for. So if I don't, then they're all together. What does it mean? I have no idea. I thought right? if if it compresses without losing too much precision, it's it's already it already demonstrated the point. Yeah, but what is it telling you? Like, what does it tell? If you don't decompress it, what is it telling you in this particular case? Uh, it means uh, well. So maybe we can continue right, this uh, during the discussion. Yeah. Can <laughs> we take a break now? Are there any other questions? Are you are you done with the first part? First yes. Part? Yeah. Okay. So let's think about that. That was a good preview of the discussion. We can take a quick break. <laughs>
Okay. All right. First off, then I want to thank Brian Xiong, who apparently is, he's the lead author and he's listening in right now and making comments and probably like answering all the questions better. Give him a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So I, I emailed to ask him whether there's code. So I'll, I'll take the liberty to, to just re, read quick. He said that uh, they will be releasing a code base soon, which will include multiple projects using this method. And he said the easiest way to implement it in any existing code base is simply to replace y equals wx with y equals w diagonal c. So the diagonal matrix with a context vector c times x, where c is a random binary vector, the one with entries negative one plus one. So that was his response. And he said, for x of dimensionality 256 or more, we have found that method to work quite well. So Brian, you know, wherever the camera is. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I don't know. That's tempting. I'm okay. curious now. <laughs> yeah, okay, but I, I was just read the thing and holding the focus. I wasn't listening completely. Uh, Brian said, hello all. Just saw this channel. I want to say the discussion is great. Uh, here's a, a couple of comments he made. Number one, uh, contexts don't have to be invertible. The invertibility was just showing that we are using destructive inference to create orthogonality and not something uh, obvious like zeros. Uh, for example, one zero zero, uh, zero one zero are clearly orthogonal. Uh, minus one one minus one one and one 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 are orthogonal because the positive cancel the negative elements via addition. Uh, the second point, uh, most recent analysis in in cur current in the works, like uh, current in progress, shows that binary numbers uh, minus one one works as well as complex numbers. So no need to go to complex values. Uh, third point, the, the topology diagram is regrettably confusing and was only meant to show where parameters live for each type of context vector, binary, complex, rotational. The main takeaway, you can use context vectors, uh, for example, random vectors, to hide multiple models inside one model. All this entails is simply multiplying your input x by a random vector of minus one plus one. Whenever you want to use that particular model, you just use that specific minus one plus one vector. That's go. all. That's all. Okay. Yeah, the man himself. Okay. Well, we'll continue then with the. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'm still getting I'm getting used to that. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to get to the results. Hopefully this might also, besides the comments we just got, well, maybe some of the experimentation will clarify things a little bit. So the, the first thing they wanted to see is, was the redundancy being utilized and will it work? Will it make a difference? So what they did was with the, they used the data set permuting MNIST. Uh, they do add a standard neural network. I think this is a feed forward neural network. Well, it has to be because their PSP networks uh, are two layers and they change the number of parameters. They start with 128 and they double it every time. Uh, permuting MNIST, uh, I had the hardest, for all the data sets, I had the hardest time finding it. These are not well used and popular. Um, you, you download MNIST and then there's some code you can grab on repos. Uh, I th this is from another paper, altogether different. I think that's when they say permute, they mean that. I, I think it's one single permutation, random permutation of the pixels applied to all the images, the same one. Uh, and then maybe then for a different task, then you do a different permutation. I think that's what it is. So at any rate, it looks like pretty close to random. This doesn't look like an easy task. Uh, here we go with the results. The noisy 
lines here, okay, uh, this is average accuracy steps. You can see that's like a 10,000 steps all the way to 50,000. Um, you can see the, the noisy results here. These are all the standard vectors. They also doubled the number of neurons that they used for the standard vectors. They all did really bad. As, as it went on, as you added more tasks, What's the, what are we trying to predict here? Uh, what number it is. And, and, okay. and this, so given, given and this classification, image. yes, that, that so is zero. Okay, so, okay, I see. Yes, so that, the same task. That, oh, okay. so, right, right. Okay. Zero, one, okay. two, three, four, yes. That's classification, okay. right, gotcha. Yeah. Good. How, how does this relate? What, what models are being superimposed here? Like, looks like there's just one data set. Because okay. then you permute it again. And again. So for so for each permutation, you have a different model. Is that your, is I believe so. Okay. Yeah. I believe so. You, so. so you have a set of k different permutations. Yeah. And each one can be thought of as a different data set in some sense, a different model. That's and my And you're superimposing all of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And these 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 are all unique data sets to continuous learning tasks. So if any time you're looking up continuous learning or online learning, then you're going to see this and the other data sets. So this is apparently, you know, used frequently for the continuous learning. So yeah, it's task. So you can see that those are 10 tasks gets us to 10,000 uh, iterations. And so that's a total of 50 tasks. Uh, the reason that's dashed line there, I will get to in a moment. They, they're comparing it with PSP binary. So again, the, bin the context vector entries are negative one and one. Uh, we're seeing, first of all, it works. It's, it already, even with the 128 nodes, it does better than all of the other standard ones, except for this tiny, tiny little spot here at one point in time. And more is better is important. So one, it's working. You're getting results. And two, it's exploiting extra nodes. You're, you're getting more out of it. So you're, you're getting 128, 256, 512 nodes, 1,024, 2,048. You know, and at 2,048, there's hardly any degradation in performance. And you can see here, 2,048 nodes uh, So on a standard network. So there is a difference here. This isn't just you know straight up memorization. So distributes the learning on different nodes. Is that what it does? So for example, on the context one, the nodes are for example, ten first nodes are more activated, and the second one, this, this is what we're, it does. we're talking for the superimposed. Their their PSP network. The understanding is is that all the nodes are being utilized. Yeah, but I mean like. You say that for, if you have it for a simple task, then for example, you say it's not utilized completely. So what do you mean exactly like that? The, okay, yes, here's the thing. The redundancy amongst all the weights, it is not, if, if I'm understanding you right, it's not that these few weights are being used and the rest of them are not being used. So can you clarify what you mean by redundancy in the network? How do you describe this? Because this is, well, this is the interesting thing about neural nets, because you have this distribute, because it's a population-based distributed representation. So, um, so if I may add, so like in, an, in a neural net, you don't want um, a single neuron to be responsible for a single decision, because if that makes a mistake, then there is no way to correct mm -hmm. it. So you do want redundancy distributed over uh, your activation layers or whatever layers you, or uh, weight matrices that you have. So you want to have redundancy, if that's what you want. Yeah, so, and so like drop hydro, mm -hmm. for example, drop some of the nodes, which are relevant, but in here you, you use them for like training these redundant ones that you're you using the nodes more. And it, and it gets, and your question is like perfect timing because they do a, what they did is they, yeah, one sec, I'll finish this point because it's related to what he was asking. Um, because what you're talking about then is say uh, with a lot, a lot of neural nets, these certain weights, these certain parameters, these certain nodes are dominating and doing most of the work. And that's why you can do pruning. That's why you can do this compressing, this distillation, and you can shrink down uh, to a very small size network. This is why you have that, uh, intrinsic dimension result uh, for, 
for some tasks that are much smaller than a lot of typically deployed neural nets. You can do that. You can shrink it down. And the pruning that they, they that you would do, like what they tried to do a pruning, and the pruning they did was a thresholding one. So if the uh, weights are uh, too small, uh, below a certain threshold, they get cut. And I, I, this I'm not too experienced or familiar with, but apparently that's a fairly common way of, of pruning networks. And you can c drastically reduce the size of a neural network that way. That's what I've heard. They tried to do this, and they weren't able to reduce it using standard pruning algorithms, which what that says is the nodes are being used. All the weights are being used, or perhaps not all, but many, a lot of them. They can't really compress this. So if you want to say that, imagine you are training in a neural network, and then if you use dropouts, it's shown that, for example, you will have better results. Why? Because well, some of the nodes which will uh, like collect noise, you will try to get rid of it randomly, right? But in here, uh, because that you try to differentiate between different contexts, you don't need such a dropout thing, right? Because every node is like being used because it will learn information based on the context it's provided. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. So they don't use dropout? No. Okay. No. no regularization. So just before that, we have two questions over there. Well, 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 the previous one. If, if you go to the previous, uh, how, uh, how how were the models evaluated? Were they evaluated on all 50 tasks, or like after after the first 10 tasks, the models were evaluated on all 10 yeah, tasks? Yeah, right. Like, I, I yeah, I know what you're saying. It makes sense that they would test it then on all prior tasks as well. Yeah. Uh, hold on, I'm trying to see if I've got that in the notes here. And I'm assuming that. Uh, between 10,000 and 20,000, the network has never seen the first 10 tasks. Like after 10,000 steps, the model has never seen the first 10 tasks. Yeah, it's not retrained. Yeah. If, for sure, it's not retrained. Okay, so yeah. how do they evaluate performance? Like, do they. Hold on a sec. I want to check to see if I can find this. Because um, they're saying, I believe they're averaging over multiple. Okay, what was it again? The, oh man, I don't have it here, sorry. Somebody can, uh, you want, you want to answer? <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. Yes. Our charts, our, uh, Brian said, our charts mainly show accuracy only on the first task, because that will forget the most. Uh -huh. In the table, we show average accuracy across all tasks. Yes, the table, we're going to get Okay, so actually then this is more important. So their average accuracy just on task one? Uh, on the first task. Yeah. So actually only on the first task. Yeah, so this is our catastrophic forgetting that we're seeing here. And we're seeing less catastrophic forgetting. And the catastrophic forgetting is bad. It's, it happen, it's guaranteed to happen for continuous learning. That's my understanding from the little bit that I read from the additional read literature. Mm -hmm. It's a real problem. Uh, and it's and it, like it's a showstopper problem. So that makes this important. So um, yeah, it might be a bad question, but what is the step? Iteration. Training on the like gradient descent? Yeah. On how, how, why does it go down? But why the accuracy is accuracy going, is going you mean for the accuracy is going down because you've retrained on one data set okay. and now we're training on other data sets. Oh. And we're getting that catastrophic okay. forgetting. But, but, yeah. But. When it's yeah, when you're training something new, you're forgetting what the old it's being written over. Right. So each iteration is in a separate permutation? Is that I think it's one thousand iterations per task. Yeah, well, because we have, well, yeah, we have 10 tasks at 10,000. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then they're showing a histogram of, I'll have to admit, I don't fully understand that either, but uh, we already went over that. They, they weren't able to prune it. And I guess the other notable point was that it was the last layer where the weights were most evenly distrib distributed. 
and where they had high magnitude? Not, not, not quite. It tells you the magnitude of the weights and the height of the bar is the frequency. So in layer three, you can see that there are quite a few uh, uh, weights that are 0 0.4, but there are almost none in the in the uh, in the standard one. Oh, is that how you read it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't figuring. Okay, you're doing better than me. In terms of, my, no, I just had I just had to plot them. That's yeah. Why. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. The blue, by the way, if, I don't know how well you can see it because it's it's not the clearest image, but the blue is the standard network. So, all right. Uh, sorry, why the number of, why the value of those weights are over 20,000? No, that's the count. Oh, sorry, my bad. What's the question? That's what it is? Uh, it's a yeah, frequency. Sorry, I, I, yeah, it's yeah, an yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. They could have right. normalized it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, all right. Yeah. That's good. All right, then. So, next set of, ta the next task, or the next experiment, Instead of changing the input, they, oh no, hold on, I'm not there yet. We're, this is, uh, then they wanted to compare the different, uh, the variety of context functions that they have, whether it's the binary, the complex, so, and the one power. So here is standard again. Here is PSP binary, uh, complex. One power is actually doing better than uh, complex, and one power is like, you know, about as simple as it can get. And then the rotation one, it does the best and it also, you know, it has the most parameters and it's the most complicated. So uh, in all cases, they're, you know, they're doing just miles better than a standard uh, network. Uh, yeah, this is a comparison with prior art. Uh, that's the table he was talking about. Uh, this is some of the Kirkpatrick Okay, Kirkpatrick, they did constraints. Uh, I won't get into the details, but they did a variety of constraints or a, a constraint in order to preserve the important weights from previous models. Zenke, uh, what they said is, hey, biological uh, synapses are complicated, so we're not going to have scalar values for weights. We're going to have complicated uh, functions of some time to represent the synapses. So you got more parameters and yeah, it does better. And they show that, you know, for their three networks, the, the binary, the complex, and one power does comparable with already what's out there. Uh, so that's just what we see with that one. So now the, the next experiment is output interference. Uh, you're changing the output uh, labels. So this is classification. Uh, the data set is iterative CIFAR. Uh, again, they're, now they're using a convolutional net. And, and I believe this one is a six layer convolutional net. The ICFAR, the, it starts off with one task where you train it on CIFAR 10. Each subsequent task, you know, it's an iteration, is taking 10 random classes from CIFAR 100 and taking disjoint sets from those 10 <coughs> classes. What I'm not sure about with each subsequent task, like they say that you make sure that it's different subsets that you're, you're sampling for each subsequent task. It's not clear whether it's 10 different r random uh, categories again. And so that part wasn't clear. I couldn't find the answer to that. So uh, normally with the output layer, when they try tasks like this, they'll over provision and they'll have an output node for every possible class that's, that they're gonna come across. And you just do a uh, softmax over the few for the given task that are, well, that are relevant for the given task and the rest are, are not utilized. They don't do that, they just do one 10 node output layer and they leave it at that. They do the same thing with the standard network and you can see uh, the result here is, I mean, the standard network drops like a brick after it's done with ICFAR task one. Uh, and, but their PSP networks, uh, in this case it's complex and one power, 
continues to go along just brilliantly. So again, uh, you know, this is working well. So at the, these are the last experiments, and they want to get more elaborate. And uh, they want to see now, instead of having the case of the distinct tasks, we're going to try and start blending them and mixing them up. And they're using rotating MNIST, rotating fashion MNIST. Uh, oh, here they're using the six-layer convolutional net. And it's rotating means exactly what you think it means. It, they're rotating the images. Uh, so, and this is done smoothly. Every iteration of the training, it's rotated a little bit. Okay, let's see. It's 1,000 rotations for one full revolution. And uh, let me try and remember. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll jump right to here. For the PSP networks, they use 10 uh, contexts. For uh, So that would mean that it's 100 um, uh, training iterations and 100 steps of revolution for a single uh, context task. And then they jump to the next context. So they, they, they still are having it discrete right now. Uh, you can see the wild oscillations is the standard uh, network, and it does, it's just not doing well. Uh, rotating MNIST, rotating fashion MNIST. It, not, much, it, not a major difference, just that the fashion MNIST, it does a little bit worse. You know, I mean, it's a little more complicated of a data set. Uh, so I'll just do a close-up so you can see the very top. Uh, the rotating... The red here is the rotating PSP. Uh, I believe that's one power again. Yes, one power is doing well. Uh, PSP complex, and which one was? No, PSP complex is the blue, or whatever color that is. Orange, orange is one power, <laughs> green is binary, red is rotation. At any rate, they're all fairly close together. Uh, and they're holding up. Um, another uh, close-up, this is what they did. You can see, actually, surprisingly, uh, PSP rotation is actually doing both the worst and the best. It's the one that's dipping down a lot. But when it is up high, it's, it is slightly up higher than the other ones. So that's interesting result. You know, the one with the most parameters is it's not doing behaving very reliably in this case. So, mm -hmm. so does this mean that there is one of the ten, one of the ten rotations, one of the ten rotation groups is it just not performing well at? Like that's my understanding. They're testing. They say they every time they do it, uh, these results are always on the test set, and they're always testing on zero degrees. That's what they say. No rotation. Okay. Okay. All right. So then they said, this is for the last experiment. They said, let's see what else we can do. Um, the first thing they do is PSP fast. Well, first of all, the baseline the, to test with is PSP complex. That's the blue one up here. Then they, they try PSP fast, where they're doing a context for every single rotation. So it's 1,000 models. Uh, and that's this result here, which isn't that great. Uh, then they said, okay, well, let's try, if you remember that window average of where you're doing the previous context, the current context, and the future context, and averaging those out, they called that the local mix. So this is PSP fast local mix. So you're doing 1,000 models, and you're doing uh, a, a rolling average, so to speak, of the context vectors. And it's interesting, there is a difference. It actually helps in this case, which is a great because that's like our intuition. It's like the images are rotating. What if we started having the, the there's a, a some form of a continuity between the images for the different tasks. So what if we were to you can't try and capture that with a composition of context vectors? And yeah, it does make a difference, it does work. Uh, they drop down to, uh, back down to 10 models, 
and then they apply that uh, window average, and that's, that's the top one here, uh, and that one does the best in this case. So the takeaway is that superposition works, Distinct models can be stored and re retrieved using the same parameters. Uh, we'll say, we'll agree that the error induced by superposition is low because the results showed a considerable difference. Um, this is good. We, we, you know, an advantage is, is we can also control how the parameter capacity is allocated. You have freedom. You can try all kinds of different ways. Uh, more parameters mean, can mean better performance. Uh, parameters were used efficiently. And superposition uh, networks perform better than a, a standard stock network for continuous learning. So, and then they finish off by just saying, you know, that the, this is a, you know, just laying the, the foundation and so that there's going to be, you know, a lot, whole lot more experimentation to come. So, that is it. Do you want to go back and talk about the equation? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and we got, I grabbed the, all the other equations from the paper too, so we can <laughs> pop them up. Yeah, there's a very extensive sort of appendix, I guess, that you included. Yeah. If any of you want to see all the equations, you yeah. can see them. But yeah, <laughs> I suppose you, well, you folks have got copies of the paper as well, so. All right. I do have just one question before you get into this. So, how different is this method from uh, having a one hot vector for every task and just conditioning the batch norm layer? There is a work that was done called conditioned batch normalization, and uh, you can have uh, where you have one hot vector. Well, I don't think that work has one hot vector for every task, but I'm just thinking that you can extend that work to have one hot vector for every task, and then using that one hot vector, you switch on a different batch normalization. Didn't Elmo have a similar thing? Like they had a, a I, I, context that would switch the context of the task. But, so Elmo is this, you can use it for language modeling, uh, this embedding, uh, embedding uh, word embedding framework. And you could also switch. I think I'm just emphasizing. No, no, yeah, yeah, but yours as NLP, yeah, <coughs> one's mine's with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically you just, yeah. Yeah, those two, because you're talking about something more specific where batch, there's something done to batch normalization. Yes, yes, you, you do different batch normalizations according to the task that you have. Do they say what happens when you do that to the weights? No, no, no. I am saying, how is this method different from doing something like that? I, I don't think that paper did that explicitly, though maybe I need to get back to it. Yeah, well, without knowing more about it, the, for, the main intuition, uh, the, well, the first thing that I can say about this compared to a lot of other techniques, because there was there's several that were mentioned in the references, including, uh, what was it, uh, enormous oversized uh, network. Uh, Google had one. What was it? It was Hinton. Gi ginormous or something like that. Are you talking about GPT-2 or language model networks? Or Man, I can't remember. A mixture of experts. Yeah, well, the mixture of experts was involved. And they had a gating uh, network. And the, the gating network was, was also trainable. But the yeah. thing is, it, it's, it was enormous. It's yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, you don't get to take any advantage of information between the different experts, between the different models. You have a bunch, they're all discrete. And so how do we know there could be uh, capacity within each dis discrete uh, expert? There could be capacity that's not being used. Uh, and also there could be important information be that's between the experts that's not being captured. Now you could argue, say, inputs were kept it, you can, there could be all kinds of architectures that are saying we're capturing important information between different input data. But which one are saying we can capture important information between our parameters themselves? So right away, the mixture of experts or anyone which has discrete models 
can't say that. You can't exploit any of that information. The other thing is that, um, and also they're, they're huge. Um, and what was the other thing? Um, okay, anyways, if it comes. So they heavily task, so in deployment, they heavily task the local machine, right? If, if you do use any ensemble or mixture of experience uh, techniques. Uh, so you, it seems like you postpone some of that processing to prediction time, which is not you know, optimal. Right, yeah. You're saying that these big things, are they're a burden when it comes to production? Yes. And yes. Yeah. And, and I would expect a, a huge advantage here. You know? It seems like it's marrying two different paradigms. One, mixing or ensembling a few um, models. Um, and um, and the other uh, doing multitask sort of learning at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. We in this paper we emphasize the continuous learning. You know, it doesn't have to be that, but so, that that's that was like the uh, the obvious uh, kind of domain where this shows its its greatest advantage. But I, I, if we use our imagination, imagine there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can we can find where this can be used. Okay, well, I'm, this is merely a suggestion for you. Uh, somebody from Facebook said there's an easy way to increase the intrinsic dimension, that is, just scrambling all the labels, and then your intrinsic dimension is way higher. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah there was, sorry. Oh. Basically means if you are... If you're interested in seeing, uh, in verifying this, just do an experiment and uh, see if the compressed result got wildly off. Yeah. That reminds me of that. If there's the paper rethinking uh, generalization or something like that. And they were talking about how um, they started off randomizing the input, then they randomized the output, then they randomized both. And then they got good quality training results, which said that our models are rubbish because they're learning ran. They're, they're just memorizing ran. It is rubbish, but, but it's still represent just on a very much higher dimension. Yeah. So yeah. They, they mentioned it's that. Good rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Meaningful rubbish. But that 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 sort of questions any high parameter size model. That's being developed right now. Good point. Right. Yeah, okay. Can I ask for you to go through the equation? Because I was ready for this. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I'm still not 100 percent sure, by the way. So any facilitators who can help. Yes. yes. Yeah. Any help would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> because here's the con see this part actually, yeah. this is actually not that good because it gets confusing. I think I got it finally. Um, I wonder if I should go to the other slide where they talk about how this is related, the equation where it's, they're relating it to Fourier transform. Uh, it's really important. Yeah. Can you say like what J index is here? So yeah, yeah, okay, well let, let's at least start with that. Let's start off yeah, with so what's it doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is the I index is which uh, output of the layer? So it's why it's it's one of the it's node i, uh, j is the index of the input, and also and so that's why you have w i j. So it's weight rho i with the the j elements for you know that the weight vector for that one particular node node i, uh, and so and the context context c j will be the single scalar value. That's going to be used for uh, xj, you know, scalar value xj. The sub, the parentheses s is they're telling us that like that's the that's where our our mo, our task number goes. K equals one, two, three. When it says s, that means we're saying the entire set. We're summing over all the different tasks. So that's what s is. Uh, so you're you're summing, you're first summing over uh, all the models, their, their specific weights, their associated, right, 
context vector, the inverse context vector, and xj. So you're, are you trying to say that k, context k is the one that you're trying to retrieve right yes. now? Yes. And, and the model is summed over all the... Yes, vectors. s represents okay. all the models. Okay. Or, well, yes. all the index, all the yeah, indices right. for all the models. All different contexts that you've summed over. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I'm assuming here that it's, we're, we're just doing integer indices right now to keep right. it simple. So you're summing over, so for every j value, you know, you got to, we're summing over. Here's a way to think about these equations because this kind of messed things up. Let's pretend then that the models are separate networks right now in a, in a way. Yeah. So we're summing over them differently. But the reason they're not exactly that, because we have now, you know, the context oh. vectors here that allow us to pretend those are different weights, you know, but it's all from the same thing. Right. I, that's, yes. So, and down here, what they're doing, they just break this up, either algebraic manip manipulation. When S equals K, you're going to get CK, the inverse CK times CK cancels out, gives you an identity uh, vector, and that's when you get this one here, which is what we want. That's the normal, you know, dot product uh, that goes into the activation function. This is the leftover here because now CK and say, say if K equals 1, C2 minus 1 is not going to cancel out with this. C3 minus 1 is not going to cancel out with this. It's going to be something different, hopefully a very small number, because you want this overall thing to be very mm -hmm. small. So and that's, yeah. If you can arrange for all the different contexts to be exactly orthogonal, would the residual disappear? That's my understanding. Yes. But this is the inverse. You're right, yeah. Yeah, but that's that is my understanding. I thought but it, that was the intuition of it, though. Yeah. And this is the case, though, when we're doing that element-wise product, because if you're doing a rotation matrix, that's going to be, you know, different. Well, the vector is W S times C S. If that left chunk yeah. is orthogonal to the right thing, then then yes. But, well, then. Yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. exactly. What yeah, I think that's what it is, because I kept banging my head when we were having a conversation. Okay, is it orthogonal or not? Like, what, what is this? What are we doing? Mm. Sort of, kind of, I think. Yeah. yeah, you know, but at any rate, the bottom line is this needs to be small. That's what we want, because that's going to be the destructive interference, unless you want them to interfere. See, yeah. When we're getting fancy and we want them to okay. interact with each other, then, oh, well, this is a different story. We don't want that to go close to zero, you know, because now there's... There's, there's a reason you want them to blend together for some reason. So that's the understanding of this one. So this is for the element-wise product. Yeah, so, uh, good? Yeah, and as to say, one. the proposition, proposition one basically says that this right-hand part of the sum does go to zero on expectation. The right, the interference part, the bad part, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Right, so that proposition is like the whole point Kind of in some sense. Uh, right? Oh, right? I see. Oh. That's saying that that's the thing they call epsilon, and proposition one says, in expectation, epsilon goes to zero, right? Because Under you were saying the epsilon. that's the expectation over the elements of the vector. Saying the average value of epsilon will be zero. zero. Yeah. And yeah. of course, they don't say they don't. Uh, there's some assumptions there about how you know, what distribution these C things lie on, right? They yeah. explain that in the appendix a little bit, but they prove. But um, there we go. Yeah. But the whole point, I mean, that, that proposition kind of justifies using this whole approach in some sense. It, it guarantees expect, that this will. Is it expectation that you have a large number of tasks? Uh, good question. Or, um, or large, a large dimension. It's yeah. Um, maybe there is more orthogonality. The probability of orthogonality. Not sure. Um, well, in the main part of the paper, they don't say anything about that. They, the, the theorem is not well posed, but in the appendix, they tell you all the assumptions that go into it, and it should say there. I forget. Yeah. Because of this point, like one, one over m on the model condition. Yeah, but what are those? Well, it's that six point in the appendix, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you can think of C of S uh, times the inverse of C of K. 
time steamers? Is that hard? Yeah. As just another random minus one plus one vector with, with respect to x. So when you add them together, they will destroy each other element-wise. It won't destroy itself with c, c, c k times inverse c k because that just equals to, to one for all elements. Uh, c, c of k just needs to be symmetric and random because you want destructive interference. Symmetric and random. So okay. c k should be like orthogonal to the space that, is, that has vectors that are orthogonal to each other. Is that the idea? And then we try to map this space into this orthogonal. Right. Planes and then try to get this your network. Is that the idea? Yeah, this is this is element wise for for C. That's what we're talking about. The, yeah, it's it's element wise for C, right? The, the, what you want for the, the properties. So C has a space which is like which is like constant uh, like comprised of orthogonal vectors. Is that correct? Orthogonal okay. in this element-wise product. Orthogonal. I think is what the author was just commenting. Right. So it's not it's not the usual notion of orthogonality in the matrix there product. There are pairwise, pairwise orthogonal based on this multiplication. Element-wise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Any other comments? Does anybody feel the desire to share the application you came up with in the circles part or? No. I have yeah. a half baked talk. Oh, <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> um, it's, um, ha have they discussed like um, using this in some kind of like security or privacy preserving mm -hmm. case mm -hmm. where you need the context vector to use the model? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so like a key, so then it would be a huge, a huge context vector, which is. Which would have cryptographic oh, properties. Oh. Should, uh, should try doing that. <laughs> start, yeah. Start your own company, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a neat It's a billion dollar idea. I was thinking of trying with GANs with the mode collapse and having uh. a separate, a separate uh, model for each mode so that it doesn't uh. collapse into one. And then when you want to interpolate between them, start interpolating the context vectors along with the input. You know, or well, no, not the input, but along with the z vector, and see what happens and what happens if you interplay between the z vector and and the context vector, mm -hmm. yeah, stuff like that. So, um, one thing we were discussing is uh, trying to play AlphaGo. Uh, sorry, sorry, what AlphaGo? Atari games. Atari games. Uh, yes. Different context for each game. Yeah. 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 What about like a a chatbot that speaks multiple languages. One each language is a different context. <laughs> for the language, <laughs> yeah, for the Wait, languages that are similar, right? So well, I don't know. I mean, no, <laughs> well, it should be different because well, when they're similar, then this part would be construct, interference, yeah. and then oh, you can you can use the interference yeah. part to make it easier because they share uh, that, right? They share yeah, already they share. A, so a, would, like a root huh. in this case of languages. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm thinking in terms of like now you can compress even more because if it's several languages yeah. that are different but not too different, you can maybe capture that shared information. It should be able to, yeah. with uh, where the context vectors aren't fully orthogonal or something, or yeah, or totally different languages. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One context for each language. I know. Yeah. Here's a word. Yeah. So if you come up with the eigenvectors of this, for example, the space, and then try to train it. Neural network based on the combination of different like uh, this eigen uh, this eigen basis uh, this basis that you have. That's for the untreated uh, weight matrix. I mean, for example, you have this uh, you have this X, and then you try to do it like PCA and get like for example the most important like the eigen vectors of that, and then try to apply it in here. I mean, like try have a combination of uh, trained based on different type of you know, either vectors that you choose. Except this, except I understand that that may be like computationally more expensive, but other than that, do you Oh, you mean for like different models? Different in contexts? here you try to project it on a, on, a, on a project based on this context, but I say, okay, rather than having this type of context, why not use it with PCA? Because it would help you like 
to have uh, have the base uh, basis for that information that you have, right? Are you talking about using PCA to extract different data sets? Yeah, I mean, uh, instead of having this context, you would have to say, okay, this this five like most important components can be like one context, the other five can be other context, and then try to trade on that rather than. They are already orthogonal to each other, so they are already. The, so, but this is different. Uh, yeah, but this is different than PCA. Like this is, I understand well, PCA that PCA would be one of the Ws, right? What's that? P PCA would be one of the Ws, so it would be one or one of the Ks. But what I'm suggesting is that instead of having this way to differentiate between the contexts, why not using PCA to differentiate between the contexts? If I understand you right, you would be applying PCA over the weight matrix. Not over the weight hmm? matrix. Over the weight matrix as well, yeah. No, but this then it's not a reduction, then you will end up with like, right? So usually you apply PCA to reduce the dimensions of, right. of something or to get the basis vectors of something. Right. So. Uh, I mean, you think you are sort of getting the basis by applying this context on each of them. But what you do is that you also have the same dimensions that what it does. Is that correct? No. Quiet. So what I think here it's the other way around. You have different bases, right. okay, and then you're combining weights with these different bases, and then adding a. Yeah, thing. but you have this one. You have like proposed the basis it yourself. I'm saying why not get yeah. the basis from the from data itself by PC. Oh, I'm not sure that's possible. Why is that? Or or because because PC is already it's one of the parameters is k k equal to whatever. Right, so you are training your data. So in PCA, you have your data, and your model is PCA. Right? You want to know what are the most important parameters there. That's your model. That's k equal one. Right? And your other model is, say, the, again, for example, you have a you have a data for purchases. Right? right? And then you want to know, okay, from all the data that I have, what are the most important things to predict purchases next month? Right. And then you run PCA. Right. Once you run that, then you get a couple of components. Right. I don't know. Color, male, female, and whatever it is, right? And then you run another model to predict something else, right? So that's the second model. Right. So in this case, these two would be k equal 1, k equal 2, and you run them at the same time. I understand that, but so, imagine, uh, I guess we can have it offline, yeah, but okay. the idea is that, you know, imagine that this PCA would give you like different bases, right? Like each of them, one vector, like the most important one, if you take a couple of these bases and then apply it, right. you would have the like, more compressed, uh, compressed view of that data, right? Yeah. Okay, then I say that, okay, you could have a combination of these Basis and then uh, consider them as context. Right? So how this what do you mean by combination of these bases? Usually you end up with like the top K okay, uh, right bases. Then, yeah. Okay, rather than top K, you could select, for example, like a couple of the first 10 as like the first context, the second one is the second, like second pair as second context, and so on. Oh no, but uh, but the top the top 10 will explain most of the variance in your weights. Okay. And so the other ones are gonna are going to explain very little of your weights, and so there, there, there'll be... The rest will be... Yeah, the rest will be meaningless, yeah. So now you're talking about, if I understand you right, you're talking about applying PCA over the weight matrix. Yes. Yeah, that's what you say, yeah. So you say that would be meaningless. But of course, if you do that with their network, you're destroying useful information. Independent of each other. Like that's the that's the premise that we were discussing just earlier. They're independent of each other. Yeah. Right? And they're already they're already the not the eigen vectors. I, right. No, they I are understand already... that it works. I was like saying, okay, uh, in comparison to this type of artificial what would be, what would be the problem with applying sort of PCA and try to retrieve the information. So so his his argument that it would be meaningless, but this definition of meaningless I should like Discuss it in detail. You can discuss sure. it in detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions? 
How about coming from Brian? Yes, <laughs> we love um, hearing from Brian. <laughs> on the application, okay. Um, the encryption idea has connections to federated learning. I think that space would be very cool store store multiple models. Would be very cool to store multiple models. Yeah. I can't say too much about the mathematical security. I think that will have to be checked. So there we go. I have another like maybe last question. Uh, how many times can you do this inside of each other? Yeah, like how many models can you how stuff in? Like, because you can do this, and every K can be one of this. Yeah. Again, right? And yeah. so therefore you're like, so for example, one can be used to switch these rotational things in in the um to to learn over time and not forget. Mm -hmm. and then the other one can be to do different models within it. Is it sorry? Try try that again. So say. You have different questions, so different models, mm -hmm. and then we think that model, you train it to rotate your um, images, for example, right? So there's one sipping inside of the sip. And then how many times can you do this? Do you how mean like, like take, take one model and then start superimposing even on one model? Oh, so it's yeah. like in nesting. Yeah, nesting. nesting. How many times can you nest it? Oh, I guess it depends on your... <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, Okay, Brian yeah. 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 the, the, the number of models would depend on your tolerance for accuracy. We can say that the amount of nearly orthogonal vectors you can have increases exponentially with dimensionality. Right. Well, that's a nice feature. Now, that's just the capacity, which is, which is a, a perfectly reasonable question. But you were asking, yeah, asking even you. more. Yeah. You want to nest. You yeah, nest. Models in models in models. Yeah. Like Inception movie. Yeah. Exactly. That's my yeah. In, in terms in terms of uh, nesting models, we have some follow up work showing some Man. weird ways of nesting a single model. I, I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we promise to present that talk too yeah. when it comes out? Can I present this? <laughs> okay. So are there any no more comments? Okay. Oh, Brian has another comment? Uh, uh, okay, so stay tuned. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> some, some earlier comment, Brian said, like, Willie, really, you were doing a great job at explaining, and he'd like to thank us for for the great discussion. Cool. Yeah. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. Yeah.